Hey, what is up? Welcome to this episode of the Entrepreneur to Entrepreneur podcast. As always, I'm your host, Brian Lofermento, and I am particularly excited about today's episode. I was going to say today's interview, but it doesn't even feel like an interview because I've got an awesome guest on who's going to talk to us about all things sales. But I also know that she is just really passionate about business and growth in general. And all this stuff, of course, ties in. Sales is such an essential skill. So for all of you entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs out there, this applies to all of us. Whether you are absolutely crushing it already, you're a six, seven figure business owner, or you're just starting out, this is something that is essential to your business growth. So we've got an awesome guest. I'm going to tell you about her. Her name is Lisa Praber. She's an innovative sales leader and business development strategist who's determined to change the mindset that sales is a dirty word, which let's face it, for so many of us, that's how we think of sales. With almost 20 years under her belt, shattering sales goals for companies ranging from small family businesses to giant S&P 500 corporations, she knows what it takes to increase revenue. When guiding companies and individuals on their sales journey, she embraces the philosophy that sales is both a science and an art, which for sure we're gonna talk about today. Her vision is to redefine and standardize sales through creating roadmaps. Don't we all love roadmaps and strategies? that empower, educate, and engage entire teams. I'm not going to say anything else because I'm so excited to dive into my interview today with Lisa Praber. All right, Lisa, welcome to the Entrepreneur to Entrepreneur podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. So much that I want to dive into. Obviously, you and I were joking around off camera before we hit record today. You live in Milwaukee, which is one of my favorite small cities here in the United States. So we've got a lot. And we also, crazy world about entrepreneurship is we know some of the same people, which is wild. And so I always like to let guests fill in the gaps beyond the bios. Tell listeners, who is Lisa? Oh, man, that's a loaded question. Um maybe i could just share with you my journey of who lisa is today and where i started um i was born and raised here in milwaukee wisconsin and uh was going to school for fine arts not sure what i was going to do there but moved to arizona sight unseen had to find a job and, and fell into sales by accident to be honest with you um i had uh applied for a job they had me fill out an assessment and it told them that i was behaviorally wired for sales they had such an awesome roadmap um for training that they could hire green salespeople and train them how to be amazing um i walked into that interview with white pants with the fanciest pants i had i worked at the cheesecake factory um my hair I'm sure was wet. My shoes were all chewed up from a dog. Um, But because of these two questions I answered that said I was behaviorally wired to be a salesperson, they took a chance on me and it's changed the entire trajectory of my life and all my ways of thinking. And um, it became an epic, almost 20 year journey uh, to lead me to owning my own business focused on sales. Yeah, I love that for so many reasons. It's a story that I too can relate to. I always tell listeners that you never know what leads to what until you're able to look in the rear view mirror. And for sure that's true. Love the fact I'm just picturing you like running from the Cheesecake Factory straight into a sales training, not knowing what the heck the future holds, which is super exciting. But, and I definitely wanna dive into the behaviorally wired for sales. We're gonna talk about that. But first things first, the burning question on my mind, and I'm sure listeners are curious as well, is what's the story behind your company name. So your company is called The Middle Six. Tell that story to us. Sex Sells. It's a sexy name, isn't it? Um, So depending on what product I'm selling, uh, it changes. But really, the concept comes from uh, the 80-20 rule. And for every 10 sales, you're going to lose two no matter what you do. You're going to win two if you do your job okay. But it's what you do with The Middle Six that, that really changes the status quo. Ooh, I love that. It's not only it has a a memorable meaning, but it's also deeply philosophical and also enhances our mindset surrounding sales. So I really love that. Now, Lisa, I want to get this way 
get this out of the way up front here because some listeners are probably thinking, all right, Lisa, you are behaviorally wired for sales. I'm maybe, obviously I can't relate to this, but maybe some listeners are saying I'm an introvert or I'm on the shyer side or I'm just starting out my business. I don't really have that confidence behind selling my products and services just yet. How much of this is being wired for sales versus mastering sales? So I'll go back to my philosophy that I do believe that art is, or sales is 50% an art and 50% a science. So that tool attaches that data piece to it. Um, but when I was hired, I didn't necessarily know I was being picked because of this assessment. But I spent the first three months at 10 bucks an hour thinking I was super cool. My fourth month was 100% commission. I had an $18,000 commission check. And I spent $4,000 on a dog, the rest in Vegas in 48 hours. And that's really been my life ever since. I found my calling. Um, But as I started to grow and develop and they invested so much in me professionally with, um, you know, sales development, I ended up using that tool. It's a platform called Predictive Index um, that, that really shows somebody their behavioral drive and it shows others uh, their motivation. And, and I would hire salespeople based on that and, and help people that were selling that maybe weren't aligned to understand where their strengths were and where their caution areas were around sales. So when I started my own business, I had to buy the tool. Um, well, they wouldn't let me buy it. They wanted me to sell it for them. So, uh, for the first time in my life, I actually sell something I'm obsessed with, which is exciting, but I wanted to have the tool so I could help show my small business owner clients their um, behavioral connection to sales and help me also see that. So when I was um, helping them decide which sales initiatives to pursue, if they were introverted, I wasn't going to force them to go to trade shows. I was going to put some automations in place for them and allow them to be okay with that and understand that. Uh, I use the tool for coaching and training large sales teams too. And and sometimes people are in sales because that's the way their their journey has has gone. And there's some things that they're very good at, um, but everybody has different things that drive them and motivate them and that they're good at. And sales is more diverse than people think as far as the different positions go and what it makes a really great business development salesperson is totally different than what makes a great account executive. We've got a hunter versus a nurturer or a farmer. So we have um, all different wirings and, and I like to attach that science piece to what is I'll say notoriously known as a pretty artistic career choice. Yeah, I love that because already you've introduced us to something that we may not think about sales in this regard, which is when we picture sales, we picture, you know, being on the phone and asking for money. And you've already brought up, you know, trade shows, for example. And it's easy for people to look at you and I, who obviously just love conversations. I'll, I'll let listeners in on the secret that before we hit record today, Lisa was like, doesn't matter to me what the questions are. Like, we're going to have a conversation. And obviously that lends itself towards you enjoying sales for the way that you do it. But give us those real life examples for, you know, all the, a lot of service-based businesses listen to this show, a lot of agency owners who are thinking that there is a traditional way of doing sales because they see it on Instagram, they see it on Facebook, you know, you got to be on video creating all these video ads, you got to push people to a sales call, walk us through all the different avenues because it's interesting hearing you alluding to the fact that, hey, actually your sales avenues should go according to your personality and towards your liking for different vehicles. Yeah. And I think, you know, with small business owners, we're all going to be great at sales, especially at first, because we're passionate about what we're selling. We are the ones who created this business. So, so really a lot of my clients show up on my lap because they say something out loud, like I want to hire a salesperson. And I don't necessarily think that's the first thing any small business should do because the, that that owner loves selling. They love their baby. They love their business. And introducing somebody who doesn't have that same passion is can be maybe threatening. Maybe they'll never be able to measure up. Um, so instead, I, I encourage uh, small businesses to, to take a step back and create a sales plan. So um, there's 
dozens of potential sales initiatives that you could and should pursue. Um, but you need to be able to pick based on your budget, your bandwidth, um, and what you're happiest doing. Because the reason you started your own business is because you wanted to be happy. So um, I, I like to help allow you to do things that make you happy, but also help you recognize that you have to start with some really specific core sales tools and processes. Yeah, so you just said one of my favorite words that guests happen to say when they come on the show, which is it's either strategy or plan. And you already talked about having a sales plan. And you know that there's that age old phrase about us entrepreneurs where we love jumping off the cliff and building the parachute on the way down. And Lisa, you and I both know that most small business owners, they're caught up in so many different aspects of their business that when it comes to sales, they're just hoping to get them. They don't have a sales plan. What does a sales plan even look like? Yeah, so I think that everybody knows that sales has to come, but everybody maybe doesn't know that sales is involved in every single step of your entire process. Um, so we've got a sales process, um, we've got a sales plan. So, so I'll, I'll maybe I'll tell you a little story that helps you understand maybe my own views as I started my company on sales. Um, being that that's not my problem at all. I love to sell. Now I'm trying to balance that with operations. But um, I worked with this amazing small business consultant. Um, her name is Kylie Peters. She, her company is called Ray9. She helps women start small businesses. I kind of accidentally started my own company. I didn't really have a desire to or um, it's never been my life goal. I kind of started it out of desperation, if, a whole nother story, but um, what she helped me do was figure out what was important to me personally, um, both fundamentally and financially, what I was good at professionally, create a service, price that service, put together projections, which in turn got me a small business loan, which covered my capital startup costs, which then allowed me to have my branding and marketing done and, and everything. Um, but in my head, all of that was stuff I had no idea about. Um, and I was so grateful to have somebody walking me down that path and that journey of, of putting that all together. I probably would have been like, yeah, I'll help you. Yeah, I'll help you. And just never made money. But one thing that I'm really good at is systematizing sales and standardizing sales. So my first plan of attack was to make sure that I stayed organized from the beginning. And that first thing that I believe that every company needs and should have in order to move forward is a CRM, customer relationship management software. Um, some way to stay organized and automate what you're doing. My behavioral drive is a maverick. I'm an innovative, outside of the box thinker who's undaunted by failure, which is the perfect sales profile. The problem with mavericks is we are so bad at process. If we don't have a process, we never will follow up. We'll never, we'll never do anything consistently. And, and what suffers is really the client experience. So having a tool that keeps everything organized in one place is pretty much vital to any kind of sales planning. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought this up and this is the, the way that you chose to take that question, Lisa, because I actually did an episode, it was probably six to 12 months ago, where I said that if you only have one tool inside of your entire business, even more so than a website, let it be a CRM, because if you can't keep track of all the people who want to work with you and who, if you just followed up with, you could probably turn into clients or customers who do work with you, then, I mean, you're missing so many opportunity areas. but. I know from that episode, a lot of people went and they signed up for their favorite CRM. There's a million of them out there. HubSpot yep. loves to have a free solution for as many business owners in the country as possible. Curious to hear and feel free to name drop. Listeners love tangible tools that they can implement in their business. So whatever you like. But the even bigger and more important question behind this, Lisa, is having a CRM is one thing. What do you actually do with the CRM? Why is it so important that you, you already clarified for us, this is the thing that you need to systematize? 
Yes, and that is the golden question, and that's where your sales plan and your process come into place. Um, so name dropping isn't as important to me as, a, as just having a CRM. There's tons of them out there. Um, what's most important is it needs to hook up to your email so it automates everything and you don't have to be manually plugging in any records, um, that it is going to do some automations for you for follow-up, so have the ability to click and remind you or even send out follow-up for you. Um, it's got to be cloud-based. You've got to be able to quickly toss a name in or, or make yourself a note. And, and what I don't think most people understand that it does is you need to have it set up in a way that it plans your projections for you. Um, so when I started becoming a small business owner, I didn't really understand projections. Um, my small business coach ha had me set them up when I just started and I get this loan and I'm like, what are these numbers I'm putting together? They're made up numbers. I don't have a funnel built yet. How How is the bank going to give me money based on these guesses of what I'm going to do? And, and so I think that's where the the ball is dropped a lot of times with with small business owners really understanding what their numbers are what their actual numbers are so your crm you should be plugging in potential opportunities with probabilities attached of of how how you know confident you are that they're gonna buy and when they're gonna buy so you can plan for your growth so if you know in q4 of 2024 you have X amount of deals going and you'll not be able to service them yourself, that helps you plan for growth. So I think sales is such a dirty word, but it every organization is a selling organization. And, and if you can put that hat on and allow it to not be a dirty word and understand that every job at the company, every move that you make is all tied to knowing your numbers. So the CRM is really that way for you to know your numbers. It's not just your AR and your, your revenue. Um, it is your actual pipeline of opportunities. Yeah, I love how clearly I'm going to call this out because I think it's a really powerful statement that you just made that really puts so much of business into focus for all of us entrepreneurs, which is you said every business is a selling machine. And it's something that I think a lot of entrepreneurs forget is that when you start your own business, you are not just the practitioner anymore. If you were a, a physical therapist by trade, but then you open your own physical therapy business, you are now in the sales business. You don't just get to practice physical therapies. You have to do the marketing and the selling. And Lisa, I'm going to add into the, the dirty word mix here today because you've already alluded to the fact that sales is a dirty word, but you already said follow-ups a few times. And I think follow-ups is a dirty word. A lot of people think, oh, I don't want to follow up with that, pe that person. Lisa, this is what I hear all the time. You must hear it even more than me. I don't want to bother them. Dispel the big myth of following up being bothersome or sales in general being bothersome. All right. You know what the biggest part of closing a deal is, Brian? Oh, wrong side of the camera. It's losing the deal. You have to be okay and comfortable with losing the deal. And it takes seven no's to get a yes. We all are very busy. The United States especially. Like, I don't know how we ended up here. I wish I could move to Europe. But... Um, all of our inboxes are just slammed every single day. I prioritize things by tossing them into my flag folder. Um, some people just ignore things. Some people's inboxes are still full of emails. You're not annoying by following up. You're helping them stay front of mind. If somebody doesn't want to talk to you, they're going to tell you. I, I, it, it, they're going to unsubscribe. They're going to say, no, thank you. So, you know, I, I, I like my clients to have an absolute minimum expectation of following up at least seven times. I personally don't think you should ever stop until they ask you to. Um, if you believe that they need what you're selling, then you have every right to continue to ask for that sale. 
Lisa, I, I have a big smile on my face as you're saying this because it's probably the most, obviously I've learned a lot of uncomfortable lessons in the span of entrepreneurship. This is probably the most uncomfortable for all of us to learn, but you already just got at the important part for us to take away, which is if, if I'm following up with you because it benefits you, then I should be excited to do that. I should be excited to show up in service to you. And so as I've gotten older and more mature as an entrepreneur, I've realized that just look for any excuse to follow up, as cheesy as it may be. Now, granted, I am a cheesy person in general. You are from Wisconsin, so I think by default I can call you cheesy. <laughs> and so with all that in mind, whether it's you know National Pretzel Day, and I know that somebody likes pretzels, I'll follow up with them on National Pretzel Day. And it's, it's super cheesy, but I know that you talk about it being an art and a science, and it, it really is the blending of that. Give us some of those tangible examples of, of how you follow up tastefully and, and how you follow up in a way that not only catches their attention, but makes them be like, gosh, this is a person who I'm interested in talking to and, and working with. So I'm gonna, I'll give you some art with that. So one of the things I talk about all the time um, is the five love languages. Yes, I had a, a guy make me read that book in my 20s and I begrudgingly read it. And I thought to myself the whole time, this is gonna change everything in my career. Um, but everybody, everybody feels loved and in in sales and business will translate that to trust um everybody trusts differently and so if you use the five love languages you've got words of affirmation you've got gifts you've got physical touch you've got um quality time and you've got acts of service so those show up in a professional environment um if you keep telling somebody how awesome they are um, because that's your love language, words of affirmation, and, and theirs is gifts, and you haven't sent them that pretzel, um, and somebody else is sending them a pretzel, you may not be communicating in a way that resonates with them. Um, so I think when you're following up, it should be a, a blend of different things. Um, if you're able to quickly tell what that person's love language is if it's quality time if if, if they're always trying to put a facetime or a facetime a, a zoom on your calendar or meet you for person and coffee do that with them i mean if that's not your love language fine but but your goal is to gain trust as quickly as possible so if you show up for coffee and somebody reaches towards your hand and then pats your shoulder they're probably um, physical touch. And so lean in, tap their arm when they say something funny, give them what they need to, to gain trust with you really quickly. Um, and, and that's how you cater your follow up. Yeah, good advice there, especially because you really brought me back to, I think when I was like 23 years old is when I launched my first online course. And I remember this guy who was on my email list for a long time and I always asked my email list, why are you here? Why do you want to be an entrepreneur? Why are you interested in buying anything from me? And this guy said, I just wanna be able to take my daughter to the movies on a Wednesday afternoon. And so at least it's one of the cheapest things that I've ever done, but I mailed this guy a gift card. I looked up his zip code and mailed him a, an AMC gift card and that guy, I swear to you, like he's one of my favorite people on the planet who I've ever gotten the chance to work with. He buys everything that I launch still to this day. And so I think that that's so important to understand them as well as obviously towards the beginning of this episode, we talked about understanding us, but sales is so customer centric. It is about understanding them, which leads me to this next question of Lisa, obviously you've developed your own art of selling and it's different for everybody, but how do you get at what they actually want to get at? Because it's easy. I see a lot of salespeople ask the broad question of, well, hey, what, what are you interested in? Like, what is your ideal outcome here? And that's not always. Like, it's, it's what they know at the surface level, but how do you take it to that deeper psychological level? So there's a couple different ways we could take this. It could be what I do for my clients or what I teach my clients to do to um, discover, we'll, we'll call it discover what their clients' needs are. So um, I let's talk about it from how I help advise people to um, ask the right questions. So when you're selling something, you have to understand that you may not be the right solution. So your questions should be um, really in a mutual opportunity 
for you both to find out if it's a good match. So I, I use strategic questions. Um, so I like every one of my clients to develop five questions that allow them to um, have their prospective customer have their own psychological journey to figure out if, if they need what you're going to offer them. Um, for example, I sold um, mattresses in a long time ago career. And the people walking into the store, it wasn't a mattress store. So none of the salespeople in the store knew how to sell mattresses. So we never sold any mattresses, but we had them. So we needed to figure out how to turn it into a, a profitable revenue stream. But we didn't know anything about mattresses. So we didn't have that confidence to sell the mattress. So we developed strategic questions and um, and a, a roadmap on our side of things to put them on the right mattress uh, that allowed them to tell us what the right solution was. So our, our strategic questions were, what are you sleeping on now? Um, the first question should always be a psychological reminder to the person of why they're having this conversation with you. So in that person's head, when you ask that question, they go, oh, I'm sleeping on a really terrible mattress. It's lumpy, it's bumpy, that's why I'm here. Um, so you're reminding them why they're involved in this conversation. Uh, second question could be, what are you sleeping in now? Your side, your back, your stomach? Making sure that you're um, reminding them that you're here to ask questions. You're not gonna say, oh, you want a mattress? Come see my mattresses. You wanna put them on the right mattress. Um, what is your temperature of the night? Allow that client to know, oh, there's more things that this mattress can do than just sleep on. And this person's gonna help me understand that. Um, tell me about your health ailments. Oh, there's future things that this could potentially help with. And then what are you looking to get out of your current mattress that you're not getting now? So, so really the ultimate open-ended question for them to, be, to say what the solution to their problem really looks like. So after you've allowed them to identify what they want, then you're able to show them that you listened. So you say, based on what you told me, um, you want something that does this, 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 and this, and this is the one I would suggest. This one does this, 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 and this. So I think a lot of people go into the sales journey with their client of this discovery phase, thinking they have to prove to the client that their company is amazing, that they're amazing, that their products are amazing. And they're, so they're telling the client a lot about them, but that client doesn't care about them. And this is so corny, but they don't know that you care or they don't care that you know until they know that you care. You know, I have a lot of sales tattoos that I could strategically place all over my body and that would be one of them. But um, really the ultimate goal for any salesperson or anybody is to really ask questions first um, to make sure you have what they need. And then you can tell them how it's a good fit. Yeah, I think that's really powerful. The thing I'm, I want to really call out for listeners there is that first things first, you clarified to us of, hey, you may not be the solution. And you're right. We all, it's almost like, and it goes back to what you wrote on the notebook where you said, what are we most concerned about in closing? We're afraid of losing the sale. And so you're basically saying, yeah, detach yourself from the fact that you are the solution and let them paint the picture of the solution that they're looking for. You can then fill in that gap if you are. And actually, it's it makes it easier, I think, from our perspective because then they do that picture painting and we can be like, hey, look, this is actually, that's the exact picture that we have to, to sell to you and to provide to you to fill in that gap. So I really love that. As a visual person, I just, I picture it as you're talking about it. And Lisa, I know that that right there was just like a five minute, even just that one answer was a five minute masterclass in sales. And there's obviously so much more that you do for your clients, but I always love asking people, what are some of the mistakes you see? Because I can't let what we talked about in your bio at the very beginning of this episode go about sales being a dirty word. And obviously a lot of people do sales in dirty ways, whether it's, you know, with malintent, but mostly I would say that it's just because we have no idea what we're doing. Talk to us about some of those common mistakes since we've covered so much of this put it into perspective of hey silly goose for lack of a, a better word being totally corny here stop doing this because this is the better way 
Man, that's a tough question. I think we're all small business out here are out here just trying to survive, right? Um, I think trying to do everything yourself is a silly goose. Um, I think you should be doing what you love and delegating as much as possible. Um, if you're a salesperson who has a high attention to detail or a business owner that has a high attention to detail, it might take you a while to put together the perfect pitch deck to be exactly what the client needs and wants. And, and you might take days to do something like that um, as opposed to having a standard template ready to go. So I think, I think you have to be able to kind of roll with it and let the client set the pace. Um, I've seen a lot of people um, take too much time to follow up because they want to be thoughtful or, um, you know, just, just matching the client where they're at is really important. Um, this doesn't really answer the question, Brian. I don't know where I was going with it, to be honest. Well, well no, but I feel like even within that, you make me realize some mistakes that we all make because you're just like too much time to follow up. And I keep coming back to like the art versus the sciences. I'm just like, well, yeah, shoot, you're right. Because I don't want to be bothersome, I do wait a while to follow up. So that's a big glaring mistake, which does bring us back to the art and science. Go ahead. I have another one. This is one that assume. I've got so many sales tattoos that I could cover my body with. Um, when you assume you make a donkey out of you and I, I don't know the swearing rules on this channel, but um, that's a big thing. So I, one company I was working with in developing their sales process, um, some place that we're getting caught up is I sent the proposal to the client and they haven't responded back. Well, you are assuming that they got your proposal they opened your proposal. How do you know that? So assuming is a really big thing that happens in sales or, or projecting your own feelings and emotions as opposed to creating a process. So part of my process is, and actually it's automated through my CRM, is if they haven't viewed the proposal in three days, it sends an email asking if they got the proposal. What that does is it brings it to the top of their inbox. Maybe they missed that email. Um, if you don't have a CRM or a way to automate, make sure you're actually following up to make sure they got it and don't have any questions on it. I think assuming is a huge mistake I see people make all the time. Yes, that is a powerful, I'm so glad. That one probably doesn't get called out often enough, but I'll tell you as a consumer that when I'm in someone else's sales process, it always stands out to me. And the term that I've always used for it is, gosh, this person really gives me the benefit of the doubt. When they check in giving me the benefit of the doubt, being like, hey, I know that you're busy. Hey, I can imagine that, you know, if they take some time to see how much of a soccer and tennis fan I am, they're just like, I hope you've been on the tennis courts lately and that's why you haven't had a chance to reply to me yet. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, now I don't need an excuse to be like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't do this. Like they already just, said, hey, here's the benefit of the doubt. So I love that. Lisa, there's so much more that we could dive into. I want to ask you like 50 more questions, but obviously we're limited on time here today. So with all of that said, before I let you go, I do want to shine a spotlight on basically the values behind you and your business as well. Because I know that you're a single mom by choice. It's a fascinating part of your entrepreneurial story and your life story, of, co of course. But I think that the most interesting part of that is how you are a living example that you can have it all. You can have the things that you want. You also hire moms on your team within the middle six. So I'd love for you to talk about how mission driven you are and how that plays out in your work and, and why it's so important to you. Yeah. I, 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 I mentioned that I started my business out of desperation and, and really that is I wanted to be a slayer salesperson and a good mom at the same time. And I was having a really hard time finding that in corporate America. Um, what I know and knew is that I was amazing at sales um, and I love sales and it's my passion. And there's some people out there like me, believe it or not. Um, so one of the things that I didn't have a choice in being a single mom is I couldn't not have a job. So there's this big recession or regression with, you know, the, the chat, the being a mom is really hard to do. It's a whole full-time job. Um, and then having a job on top of that 
we can have it all and we can do it all. It just might look differently than it does for others. Um, so I really try to be as intentional as possible when hiring people for our team um, because I, I, I do believe that it doesn't matter when you're working as long as you're accomplishing your deadlines. Um, so uh, we do fractional sales or part-time sales for small businesses as part of our services. And I really love to hire um, moms. Maybe they're staying at home because it works best for their family, but inside they're slayer salespeople who just want to feel something. Um, and and why not dial for dollars during their nap? Uh, so, so, you know, just supporting the moms of the world is, important to me and and it will continue to be because I got a one-year-old and a three-year-old and it's survival mode over here. Yeah, I definitely hear you on that. As an uncle, so my niece and nephew are five-year-old twins and anytime I get to spend time with them, I'm just like, gosh, this is a handful and I'm just the uncle. So that's the easiest job in the world. Parents have it really hard. So I totally feel you on that, Lisa. And I want you to talk about fractional sales in just a second, but before we get there, I wanna mention some things because I know that listeners are gonna be just as bummed as I am that this episode is wrapping up. So I want to make sure that people know that all the stuff that we talked about here today, you actually have have one of the most extraordinary business websites that I've ever seen for a million reasons. Not only does it communicate your values, does it communicate all of these concepts as well, it also partly educates your potential buyers and hey, this is why this stuff matters, but you're very transparent about your process and the way that it works. So I guess right now I'm talking more directly to you, the listeners, to say that if you are as excited as I am about all this stuff that Lisa's introducing to us, check out her website, themiddlesix.com. I'm gonna call out the how. So obviously we've been getting into so much strategic and tactical stuff in today's episode, but Lisa on her website actually shows, hey, here's how we put a roadmap together. Here's the right questions to ask. Here's the involvement on your side when it comes to thinking about your business through the lens of having a sales process. And then on the about page, she actually lists out their core beliefs. The middle six believes sales is not a dirty word. The middle six believes sales is equal parts art and science. I'm not gonna read them all to you, but I do invite you to check it out because obviously in this episode, we've learned a lot, but there's a heck of a lot more to learn about. And Lisa, one of those things is, I think you just mentioned fractional sales. Having a team, it's it's a core part of what you believe at the middle six is you don't need to be solo when it comes to your sales. That's definitely a new concept for listeners. Talk to them about what a fractional sales team looks like and what it does and how the heck that works. Yeah, so like I told you, most of my clients arrive in my lap, um, the small business side of things, because they say something out loud like i need to hire a salesperson and i do not think that's the first thing you need to do first you need a plan so our process really starts with creating a tactical sales plan it's an opportunity for you to identify everything that you could and should do when it comes to sales but then back that up and rank them in the order that you can do and standardize based on your budget and your bandwidth and, and what brings you joy and standardize those things. So one of the things that I use in my uh, methodology is something I call the periodic sales table. So that's that play on that science of sales. I, I believe that first you have to create a funnel, then you can fill a funnel, and then you can sustain a funnel. And small business owners, we find ourselves doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and nothing's ever stabilized. So the first step is to really create a plan, um, prioritize that plan and put the wheels in motion. So after we are done with that journey, you then most of the time discover you don't need a full-time salesperson. You just maybe need someone to um, do the, the business development side of things for you or fill your funnel put those meetings on your calendar. Um, so after we go through that process, um, we know enough about our customers to feel comfortable selling for them. Um, we assign a salesperson to our customer's account and let them um, spend their kids' nap time. Maybe they're a realtor who's dialing for dollars. Maybe it's you know somebody who's retired that, again, just wants to feel something. Us salespeople are psychopaths. Um, we gotta win. Um, so you have this Slayer winning salesperson working for you um, and putting meetings on your calendars. We even take meetings uh, if that's what clients want. We'll attend trade shows. Um, 
so so we provide that supplemental sales. Um, we'll move beyond that into um, talent acquisition. We use our predictive index product to identify that green talent, kind of like how I was discovered with my white pants. Um, because at that point in the process, our clients have such a clear definition of what sales means and their roadmap and what things look like that they can bring in green talent and just tell them what to do. Um, and we also help train that person. So we're really taking sales for small businesses and creating it, doing it, hiring, and then setting them up for success to walk away. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty full, full service uh, solution we've got going on over here. Yeah, that and something that I'm sure, myself included, first of all, I'll be the first to admit, Lisa, very publicly, that I had no idea that these types of solutions exist. Gosh, do I wish I knew about you a decade ago when I started my marketing agency and was actively taking on clients. And so I know for so many listeners who are sitting here thinking, gosh, learning about sales, obviously I can see the benefit that it has for me and my business and my growth, but I didn't even know so much of what we do on the Entrepreneur to Entrepreneur podcast is to remind people that you don't have to be alone. Entrepreneurship is not meant to be a lonely journey. And this is one very strategic and tactical example of that, that even in your sales, you don't have to be alone. So Lisa, you've been a wealth of knowledge. This is like the perfect segue into opening the floor for you to tell listeners where the heck they can learn about all these awesome things that you're doing, learn more about you and your business and all the great stuff that you do to help entrepreneurs grow. Yeah, come on over to our website, uh, themiddlesix.com. Follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. Um, we, we are absolutely obsessed with sales, and um, our, our mission in life is to change your mindset that it's a dirty word. So let's talk about it. Heck yes, listeners, you already know the deal. We are linking to Lisa's business website, themiddle6.com, spelled out, so the middle six, S-I-X, completely spelled out, dot com. We are linking to that in the show notes, wherever it is that you're tuning into today's episode. Also, find Lisa's company on all the socials. Clearly, don't be shy. She loves talking about this stuff, and I'm sure, for all of us, I'm sure that there is part of our solution that Lisa offers with her wealth of experience, also the talent at her disposal, as well as how strategic she is. So definitely check out the middle six.com. You will literally see the roadmap. I'm a visual person, so I love when it's visually displayed out. So don't be shy about checking that out. Otherwise, Lisa, thank you so much for joining us today on the Entrepreneur to Entrepreneur podcast. Thanks for having me.